You know, I'm really glad that, that Chip was up before I started to talk, because I, I think I mentioned yesterday this idea of where we're safe, and I can tell you that your experience um, is, a, is a real incentive for most of us who haven't had the privilege of being in an environment where we have to latch on to each other to survive. Um, and I, I was saying that this group of prostitutes in Jakarta is the other place that I've felt enormous community because they have to have each other to survive. Maybe that's, you know, maybe that's part of what we've missed about the early church, right? They had to have each other to survive. Do you remember when the disciples are called in by the Sanhedrin and they want to examine why they're preaching this doctrine of a Jewish Messiah. And, um, and there's that famous line where one of the Sanhedrin officials says, look, you know, we don't, better not kill these guys because if it's really from God, then we'll get into trouble. But we'll just beat them enough so that they know that we don't want them to continue. And you know what the disciples say when they walk out? This is in Acts chapter 9. What do the disciples say? They said they went out praising God that they were counted worthy enough to suffer for him. Okay, so this is a real challenge because here we've got a guy who was considered worthy enough to be placed in an environment where survival meant total dependence, right? Maybe the rest of us haven't quite reached that stage of worthiness. Maybe what really has to happen is we need to get stripped down to nothing. Right? I know that my return to seeking God, which is a long process, been going on for a long time now, didn't happen until God graciously stripped away everything I was relying on. Right? Everything that I thought I could make of my own life, he had to take away. Right? I used to think, oh, well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm like that great guy, Job, uh, Job who was righteous, and then somehow God got it in his head that he needed to see how much Job could take before he would collapse. And thank you very much, God, for I appreciate that. <laughs> no, I don't think that that's right at all. I think I'm much more like Jacob, who spent most of his life trying to manage his own life and manipulate everybody in the process, by the way, right? Until God really got a hold of him and said, okay, time to come home and let's do some extraction work. And from that point on, Jacob suffers enormously in his attempt to be obedient to God. And maybe, you know, all this stuff about safety and stuff won't have much effect until you're ready to be stripped of everything. So be careful what you pray. Because <laughs> I've got a feeling that God will probably answer that one. You might not like the result. Okay, crossing. I wrote a book about crossing. It's back there on the table. And it's really the next step in our quest for what does a village look like? What, where is a, a place that we're safe? Because what happens with crossing is we discover this. And this is true of us, and it's true of everybody that we know. Every family is really a great transgenerational story. It's a story of all the individuals involved their personal struggles, their ways of interacting, their emotions, the ways of loving, arguing, communi and communicating with each other. This is from Mark Lazar's book. It's a book about addiction recovery. Okay? And what he says is really true, that you are not you in isolation from everybody else, nor are you you in isolation from your peers. You are you because you have a history. You are you because of what happened to your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents. And if you don't know what happened to them, you're going to be dealing with a bag full of stuff that you don't have any idea what's in it and you don't know how you ended up with it. Okay? And that's really what the biblical stories are about. Unpacking these bags that prevent us from being the fully human people that God wants. And the way that God unpacks bags is sometimes very, very strenuous. Right? Sometimes when we look back on it, we say, oh my God, why did he have to do that to me? And the answer is, because I wanted you to become real. And I had to pull all that stuff away so that you could actually start to see what was happening in your life. That is a scary thing. The last prayer I ever want in my life was echoed, echoed by 
David when he said, Lord, examine me and see if there be any wicked way in me. I will never play that prayer until God forces me with the 38 to my head because I know what's going to happen. Right? As soon as I open my door to God examine me, it's going to happen. And the result will be all this stuff that I would just as soon you never know so that I can pretend that I'm still okay. Right? By the way, why do we do that? Because pretending that we're okay means we're in control. And God has to strip away the control. And in order to do that, he sometimes has to take away those very things that we love the most. If you don't believe that, you don't understand Abraham. Right? Okay. So principles and stories. The reason I want to talk about this is because I want you to realize that there's a big difference in the Greek Western mindset as opposed to the ancient Hebraic mindset about what's true, right? And the way that that's communicated. In the Greek world, we believe, firmly believe, mythologically believe that we have to have the right answer, right? We're taught all the way through school on all those exams that there is a right answer. And if you just have the right answer, you'll get the right grade. So therefore, make sure you know the right answers. I remember when my daughter was trying to take biology. Trying to take is the operative word. <laughs> because she, I would try, she'd say, come to me and she says, explain the difference between mitosis and meiosis. I just don't get this, right? And I would start down the process of, okay, here's what happens with the cells. And, and then she would stop me and say, no, Dad, I don't need to know that. I just need to know what's on the test. Right? In other words, she wasn't interested in actually understanding. She just needed the answer. Well, I think that's the way most of us handle life. Right? We think we can control all this stuff if we just have the answer. So we need the proper investment formula. We need the appropriate car in the garage. We need the right trophy wife. We need the kids to be in the right sports, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because we're looking for the right answer, the way to control our lives, right? That Greek idea is not a part of the biblical idea of how we live. Why? Because the biblical idea is not built on right answers. I want you to take your Bible and every page that you think that there's theology on, throw it away. See how much of the Bible you have left. Probably from a Western view, none. Because the Bible isn't written as a theology text. It's written as love letters, narrative, epic poems, all kinds of crazy chronology that doesn't fit, mythology, poetry, all kinds of stuff, right? It's all thrown in there. Why? Because the biblical approach to understanding life is story. In other words, the Bible is kind of like the screenplay's version of a movie, right? You have the screenplay in the text, and it's your job to turn it into a movie, which means you're responsible for the mood lighting, the intonation of the actors, the way that they stand and, re and show their face to the camera or their back to the camera. You've got to direct all that. Why? Because the story part of the Bible is where it becomes alive. Right? We can go and now read the text. But the reading of the text is so different than actually seeing somebody up here walking through the text and saying, oh my gosh, look what happened with the serpent over here, and he did this, and he did this, and you know how a storyteller goes, right? Okay? So if you're not reading the Bible as story, you're just reading the black and white words. Because the real story, there is all the emotional side that God expects you to put, and by the way, that's the way Hebrews is written, that God expects the reader to put into the text to make it come alive. Why? Because it was all stories to begin with, right? It was storytelling that eventually got written down. But the storytelling piece is where the truth happens. The truth happens in the, in the emotional interaction, which is, by the way, for you younger men here, which is why text messaging is the worst possible way to communicate with anybody, right? Why is that? Because you can't feel in text, sure, go pick the emoticon, right? A, a communication is 90% nonverbal. So if you start, I have a 29-year-old son who's a therapist. He's a therapist with some of the worst court case family dysfunctions you can imagine. And what he says to me is he's scared to death of his generation, that is the 20s to 30s, because he says we don't know how to relate to people, because all we do is use our computers as the interface between us and the actual real person, right? 
And he's, and he's right. Because sitting in front of somebody and actually trying to hear them and express yourself in a way that you can get heard is very different than creating a text message. Real relationship happens in the story, and the Bible has to be read like a story, not a text message. Okay? So Jonathan Sachs says, the, the Greek idea of truth is a system, but the Hebrew idea is a story. Why? Because I want, if, if I don't have the emotional rails, I can't understand what's happening. So, that means that there's a story behind the crossing of the Jabbok, and that story goes back generations and generations, and for us to understand the emotion of the story, to discover where Jacob's safe place is, is to read it as a saga, as a drama. Now, we're not going to go pick it apart and try to find the theology. We want to feel what happens to these people. Okay? So, that means we need to ask some questions about this plot. And the first most obvious question is that when we get to the story of the Jabbok, you know the story, right? Jacob's coming back from Mesopotamia. He's going to enter the promised land finally after a 20-year hiatus, right? During those 20 years, what does he do? He manipulates everything that he can to create himself to be a wealthy man, right? He makes sure he gets the right you know, the right genes for the right sheep so that he gets the right cut coats of color and all that kind of stuff. And he comes back. He's got two wives. He's got a bunch of children. There's a whole bunch of other clues in there that we could get into if we have time. And he ends up on, on the Mesopotamian side. And then all night, it says all day and all night long, he, he transverses this stream and he gets all of his worldly possessions. Everything that he's built up in his entire life is on the Canaan side of the river, right? There's nothing left back there. Not a single coin, not a camel, not anything, right? And then it says, in the middle of the night, he goes back. So the first question is, why? Why would he go back to the nothing side? What makes it po impossible for Jacob to just stay on the side where everything is already there and continue to see his brother? Why does he have to go back? The second thing is, when he goes back, the story says, and a man shows up to wrestle with him. Ah, he says, I forgot to pay that debt. They sent the, the mafia guy after me. No, you don't have any idea who the man is. Don't tell me, oh yes, it's Jesus in his incarnate form come down to wrestle with. Sorry, the text says, and a man, an ish, a man, not an angel, not a spirit, shows up. We have no explanation of where that guy comes from or even why he's there. Because the first thing that happens is he starts wrestling. And Jacob's like, what's the deal? Why are you fighting me? Right? Big confusion that even gets more confusing as we get through the story. And the man says, after they've wrestled all night and they can't get anywhere, they're, they're equally matched, right? And then the man says, you have to let me go because the dawn is coming. Who the hell cares that the sun's coming up, right? I mean, what did, where did that piece of the story come from? Why does the rising of the sun have anything to do with letting go of this guy? <sighs> he was a vampire. And if the sun came up, he was going to disintegrate, right? No. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on here. Then finally, we don't even know what the fight was about. At the end of the fight, after Jacob gets defeated but he doesn't let go, he demands a blessing. I won't let you go, in spite of the fact that I've been defeated, I won't let you go until you bless me. Okay, so the man says, okay, I'm going to bless you. What's your name? Actually, he doesn't say what's your name, and that's a really important translation mistake. Because he doesn't say, what's your name? He says, by what are you called? In other words, he's asking, what do other people name you? Not what do you name yourself, but how do other people name you? Okay? And then he gives, the, he gives Yaakov a new name, Israel. You have struggled with God and men and, per, and persevered. New name. Okay? And we think, oh, it's wonderful. Jacob's been saved. Except the problem is, as I mentioned yesterday, all of the rest of the story of Jacob is this interplay between Israel and Yaakov. And he carries both names for the rest of his life. So something really weird happening in this story. If you thought that Hebrew stories are flannel graph Sunday school versions, you missed the point. Hebrew stories are very deep, 
filled with all kinds of clues, touch on all kinds of other points. If you read the Hebrew Bible, it's like reading this massive connect the dots you know, book, right? Because it'll give you a word here that's supposed to remind you of something that happened someplace else with the same word. And when you start connecting all the dots, you see that God is interacting with all of these things over generation and generation and generation. And the fact that our good friend here ends up in prison has nothing to do with him. Right? It has to do with what God's doing and has done in the generations that came before him and what God is doing and will do in all the generations that follow. It's a connect-the-dots game, right? You are one dot in the connection. And if you can't understand where you came from, you certainly won't have any idea where you're going. All right? So that's what the stories are for. Every story then has a beginning. But the beginning of Yaakov's story doesn't happen with him. The beginning of Yaakov's story happens in the 12th chapter of Genesis with Abraham. Right? Right? The beginning of the story of Jacob starts with his grandfather. All right? So, I want you to just think about your own story. Because this story, the story of Jacob is all about name. It's about who I am. All right? I want you to think of your own story. And, and we can start with you, since you were standing up here and graciously tell us about your place where you're safe. You have, a, you have an odd name, like mine, Skip. Skip isn't my name, by the way. My name is Arthur. Okay? No one knows that. In fact, even the people who came to the wedding thought she was marrying somebody else because it said Arthur on the wedding. Right? Okay? So no one, I mean, my publishing audience thinks my name is Skip. How did that happen? When I was about a year old, my first cousin knitted me one of those little bill caps like a captain's hat, and they started calling me Skipper. And so by the time I got to the first grade, nobody even knew what my name was anymore, right? Which means that I have a history of an unknown name because Arthur was the name of my grandfather. And I don't know anything about him because he died. And so I have this huge gap in who I am. And I suspect that if I asked you, where does your name start? many of you would have a very difficult time telling me anything about your history more than two generations ago. That's America, right? One of the things I love about Italy is that I can live in a house where the same family has been there for 500 years. There's something that's important about belonging to a name. Did you think all that nonsense in the Tanakh about God preserving the name was just because he wanted a long list of Rosensteins? No, it's because the name is the identity. Did you know that when Abel uh, is killed by Cain and God stands over the spot where it happened, the text says that God, and the Abel of course denies it, says, who am I, your brother's keeper? I, don't have, I have no idea what happens. And then God says, and in Hebrew it's very different, God says, the bloods, plural, of your brother cry out to me from the ground. Why does he say that? Because the killing of Abel is genocide. It's not murder. He killed everyone who was supposed to come from that name for the rest of eternity. And God recognizes and hears the voices of all of the people who should have been born who are now not going to be born. Yeah, plug that into the abortion argument. Okay? So the beginning of your story begins someplace, and the question is, where? The beginning of my story starts with a father whom, whose father I didn't know from a country I'd never been to until three years ago, Norway. Right? And there is a little town in Norway called Moen. It's about like six or seven houses. And someday I'll actually get there and find out where I came from. Because if I don't know where I came from, how in the, how in the world am I possibly going to help my children understand who they are? Right? So part of the biblical story is, where did you come from? And part of the exercise that I want you to think about doing is to actually say where you came from. Is to back up through your story and say to yourself, when did my story start? When did me, Chip, John, Armin, when did I start? Because I'm telling you, you didn't start on the day of your birth date. 
Obviously not. You started some months before that unwillingly. But my suggestion is that emotionally you started way before that. And as we will see, even Jacob says, when he's talking to God after his vision, he says, this is really amazing. This is the son, and he says, when he's talking to God, the God of my father Abraham, the dread of Isaac. Now wait a minute. Abraham isn't Jacob's father. Abraham is Jacob's grandfather. And yet the son, Jacob, doesn't even recognize God in his own father. It's the dread of Isaac. My father is Abraham. Right? So some major dysfunctional stuff is happening in that little verse, which you've probably read before and never realized, that Jacob's skipping over his own father in the, in the history of his relationship with God. Okay? That could happen easily in my life, because I could say of my father, absent. Which means that there was a whole big block of my life where God wasn't present because my father wasn't present. And if you want to know what's happening in our culture, just look at the absentee father and you will see enormous social destruction. Right? So, this story is about us. It's about how much do you know about your father and his father and his father's father. Because that's you. That's where you came from. And my, your job is to take that kid next to you and teach him not only who you are, but who your father was. Because you're going to hand him that bag filled with that emotional stuff, whether you want to or not. It's going to be his. It's already his. He's already carrying it. Right? Because I was watching while you were... You don't mind? I was watching while you were singing, and he was doing this. A hand in the pocket. I took a picture of that, by the way. Because it tells me something really important. That there's an emotional connection that needs to be fed. Right? It's so, so... I wish... You know, I have a... My oldest son is 45. He spent seven years in prison for nearly killing a kid in a fight with a knife when he was 20. From that day on, he and I have almost never communicated face to face. I mean, that's 25 years ago. We are, we are just now to the point where we can be civil to each other. And you know why that happened in his life? Because his father, me, was absent. I was on the road working. And he didn't have anyone. So he connected to a group of guys who were neo-Nazis. And they went out to fight. <laughs> it's a sad thing. Because I didn't act like the one who nourished the emotional needs that he had so that he could belong. As he said to me just a month ago, I've been able to survive by letting go of all of my family. Yeah. Okay. Where do you start? I start with my father. But, it, but Jacob starts with his father, a man of faithfulness. We think... Abraham, the pillar of you know, the community, the guy who's on top of the whole thing, the one that we raise up as the true father of the faithful. But look at Abraham's life. Look what happens to Abraham. He has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that story goes like this. Way up, way down, way up. Okay? I'm going to tell you the story from the relationship of his child, Isaac. It goes like this. Abraham starts off with this fabulous obedience. God calls him out of Ur and he goes. Isn't that, don't you wish you could do that? God just speaks into your life and you just drop everything and go. Of course, it takes him a little while. He has to collect all the people that go with him and all that stuff. But basically, he leaves behind an entire culture where he was safe, 
where he knew who he was, where he was connected, and certainly would have inherited all kinds of other stuff. So he goes, and God blesses him, and he gets, and by the way, that's the craziest command you're ever going to read in the Bible. Come out to this place, I will show you. I mean, okay, come out to this place, I will show you, Dan. And now you say, okay, where? Oh, well, you get, when you get there, I'll let you know. Right? I mean, it's nuts. And it's worse than that, because it, in Hebrew, it's lech lecha. And it doesn't mean come out to this place. It means come out for yourself to this place. In other words, God doesn't challenge him, challenging him just to leave. He's challenging him to leave behind who he is. Come out for yourself, right? Let go of who you are and go to the place I will show you. That's a pretty scary thing. Most of us, I imagine, couldn't handle that. But Abraham is a unique guy, and he does. And of course, as soon as he gets there, what happens? There's a famine. So this is really cool, God. Thank you for my, so much for taking me to a place where I'm starving to death. I mean, he gets there. God says, this is the place. He builds an altar. He worships. And the very next thing we read about the story is that there's a famine in the land. And Abraham says to himself, wait a minute. I thought God was promising to take care of me if I followed him. And the first thing that I discover is I can't take care of myself. My family's starving. So guess where I'll go? Egypt, right? And it works out really good for Abraham, not so good for Sarah. Because when he gets down to Egypt, he says, oh my gosh, this wife that I have, she is absolutely a doll. The Pharaoh's going to want her for sure. So you just pretend you're my sister. And of course, then the Pharaoh says, well, sister, fabulous. Bring her into the harem. And of course, that causes an enormous disaster for everybody but Abraham. Because when Pharaoh finds out that it's really his wife, what does he do? He sends him away with the gold, the silver, the camels, the mules, the maidservants, the men servants. It's like, okay, just get out of here, but take all the goods I've given you. So Abraham thinks, man, that was a great investment. <laughs> it didn't cost me anything. I mean, sure, we had to you know, do a little bit of this pretend stuff, but look what happened. It was awesome for me. I was protected and I got everything, right? And off they go. The reason that Abraham pulls the same thing with the same stunt with Abimelech is because it worked out so well with Pharaoh, okay? But in the meantime, something really, really important happens, which sets the tone for the rest of that family. That is, Sarah feels betrayed. And the rest of her life the relationship between Abraham and Sarah gets worse and worse and worse until finally at the end, they aren't even together, right? So who gets born into that environment? Well, the first thing that Sarah does is come up with the, you know, Abraham gets the promise. God's going to give me, as far as I can see in every direction, I'm going to be a blessing to all generations, all this good stuff, right? And of course, I'm sure he communicates that with his wife because a little while later, when she isn't pregnant, and they can't have the child that's the promise, she comes up with a great scheme to get one. Right? There's this, there's this nice-looking Egyptian slave in the, ca in the camp, and she suggests, wouldn't it be a great idea if we just had a substitute mother? Right? And it was not an unusual practice, but Sarah discovered that it backfired, because what happened is this. Abraham loves Hagar because Hagar has his only son. And suddenly, Sarah's idea of finding a substitute mother for her child turns out to be a laughing stock for her, because now the Egyptian woman, who was a slave, is now elevated in the community. And Abraham protects her, because it's his son. And in fact, it gets to the point where Sarah is so upset that she says, and doesn't even name the person, this is important in the text, Get rid of that Egyptian bondwoman and her son. And so it says, Abraham sent them out to the wilderness and he wept over it. He was distraught that he had to do that because this was his son. Right? If, you don't know that, if you don't know where that story came from, then you haven't read Genesis chapter 3 because it's a repeat of the same story, deliberately so. There's a verse in there that says, and Abraham listened to his wife. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> right. Same story again, right? Connect the dots, all right? So what happens, of course, is that Isaac is born. And Isaac is the apple of Abraham's eye. Oh, the fabulous thing that ever happened. It's so amazing to have Isaac. He's really the son of the promise, and everybody's thrilled. Until one day, it says, God said to Abraham, 
take your son, your only son, the son that you love, and take him to this place. Does that sound familiar? Take him to a place I will show you and sacrifice him. Um, except in the Hebrew text, there's a particle. It's called a na. It's a little, uh, looks like an N, right? And it's attached to the verb, and it changes the verb from a command to a request. It often doesn't get translated. So what God says is not, take your son. He says, please, if you don't mind, take your son. And Abraham could have said, no, thank you. I just as soon not sacrifice my son today. In which case, it would not have been a sin because God isn't demanding it. He's simply asking for a request. Okay? Which is really amazing because Abraham has also already gone to bat for Sodom and Gomorrah and saved Lot. He's chased after the five kings who took Lot and rescued them. He has defended his son Ishmael until he got, until basically got sent away and God said, it's okay, I'll take care of him. And, but when it comes to this, when God makes a request, not a command, Abraham jumps up just like the first time and off they go the very next day. And it says the very next morning he saddled up the donkey and away they went. And his son says to him, oh, here's the knife and here's the wood, but where is the sacrifice? And what does Abraham say? Connect the dots. Right? God will, when we get there, God will show you. Right? I mean, it's a dot connection. Right? So they get there. And suddenly, Isaac realizes what the hell? God's gonna, he's going to sacrifice me, right? Okay, so all this time, this is, the, this is the story part. All this time, Isaac has believed that he's the son of the promise. All this time, Isaac has believed that he can trust his father and that his father has his best interest in mind because God is telling his father what to do. And on that day, he discovers it's all a lie. Just like Ishmael discovered after 13 years that his father wouldn't protect him and sent him into the desert. Right? You might ask yourself, when that request came from God, you're the father. There's your son. God comes along and says, now, would you mind taking your son up to this place I'm going to show you and sacrifice him? What would you do? i tell you what I would do. I would say, look, take me. Don't take him. Take me. You want to sacrifice? Fine. But leave him alone. Right? Why doesn't Abraham say that? And when his son, Isaac, is on the altar, why do you suppose Isaac is not thinking, wait a minute, you rescued Lot? You tried to save Ishmael, my brother? You, were the, you, know, you showed hospitality to all these other... Why don't you stand in for me? Right? And of course, we know the rest of the story. He's rescued at the last possible second. And then a very important thing happens. The verse says, And Abraham returned to the two men and went back. But it doesn't say what happened to Isaac. The very next time we see Isaac, he's in a place called Ber Lahai Roy. Right? Uh, Ber Lahai Roy. Do you know anything about Ber Lahai Roy? In Hebrew, it means the well of my seeing. Does that connect you to another dot? It should, because Ber Lachai Roy is where Hagar and Ishmael are hanging out. Remember when they go into the desert and they're dying and God shows Hagar a well. And she names God, the only woman in scripture to name God, the God who sees me. So Ber Lachai Roy is the well of the God who sees me. It is the place where Ishmael and, and Hagar hang out. Why does Isaac go to Ishmael and, and Hagar after the attempted sacrifice? Because they, those two people, know what it means to be rejected. There's the first 12-step group in Scripture. He goes to the place where they've had the same experience of father who claimed to love them and tried to kill them. That trauma is so great that there's a rabbinic legend that when Abraham comes back without Isaac, Sarah dies immediately. What the text actually says is that Abraham comes back to a place that we never see Sarah or 
Isaac ever again in that place. The family is completely shattered. Abraham goes one way, Sarah goes another. And now you can understand why when Rebecca shows up, it says that the servant brings Rebecca back to Isaac, who takes her into his mother's tent. Because from Isaac's perspective, perspective excuse me, Sarah is the only one who ever defended him. He ended up at the end of his life not trusting that his father actually loved him. He's, he's, because it's the, the trauma is, you told me this your whole life and then you tried to kill me. How can I trust you? And there are a number of rabbis who point out that the text about Isaac is so scanty in the rest of the story and it's so filled with all these dark ideas like uh, the dread of my father Isaac that they really believe that Isaac viewed God as demonic and that he was afraid of God in big time. So now let me fill in one more little piece of the gap that you can think about during the break. Isaac has two sons. One of them is the son of the promise. For some reason, Isaac does not treat the son of the promise well at all. In fact, it, said, it says in the text, Isaac loved Esau, but it doesn't say that he loved Jacob. Why do you suppose that's true? What if Isaac realizes that if I pay too much attention to the son of the promise, God will come along and try to kill him? It happened to me. I was the son of the promise, and God tried to kill me. So I will just keep the son of the promise under the radar, and I'll honor and respect the other son so that God won't come along and ask me to kill him. I mean, it's trauma, right? The very interesting thing about that story is that it also affects Esau and changes the relationship of the father to Esau in his attempt to keep God away from the other son. And the two sons are at opposite ends of this, of this family division. I mean, it's an incredible story of how the love of father is the driving force in all of these lives and how its absence absolutely destroys them. So we have these great pyramids of the faith, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what we've dis discovered in this, just little tidbits. And the book goes into great detail to show you how all the verses have these clues in them. What we've discovered about the patriarchs is they're probably the most dysfunctional family we could ever imagine. Right? They got all kinds of stuff going on. I mean, everything that you could possibly dump into a family that would go into court and have the children removed is in that family, okay? And yet, and yet, God is the one who's orchestrating all this and moving his hand through it and bringing about his nation through these people. Do you suppose that that, that story is there to show us how important it is to be highly moral, upright, perfect in our obedience and everything, that God can only use those kinds of people who you know, stand in the pulpit with the white robe and tell you, now let us pray. I don't think so. I think what it says is that God's very interested in the broken people of the world. And sometimes the more broken you are, the more likely he is to try to use you. Because now he's got some material to work with. Right? And if you think that you're not broken, he's likely to send you to prison or into the belly of a whale or remove everything that you ever trusted in your life or the thing that you love the most, Isaac, in order to break you up so that he can, re -put, he can put the pieces back together in another way. Right? So be careful, gentlemen. <laughs> when you say you're ready to seek God, I'd be looking for the hammer. <laughs> right? I think you're in, in a, a world of hurt. A world of hurt that actually becomes the blessing that God wants. That's the key to this whole thing, see? I think we're afraid to let the world of hurt take over because we feel like we need to protect ourselves from all the shattering that's going to happen. 
And in fact, it's the shattering that brings the blessing. Why do you suppose that God says to Hagar and, I, and Ishmael, don't worry about this son. I have got a great plan for him too. Really, a great plan after he nearly gets killed by the vindictive wife, sent out into the desert to starve and die to die, has no, has no future at all, right? And then, oh, what do you realize? And by the way, an Egyptian, an Egyptian, are you kidding me? An Egyptian slave, no status, no, no welcomed identity, the wrong people from the wrong time in the wrong place, and what does God say? Don't worry, I've got a great plan for you, right? And in fact, if you really read that story of Hagar, you'll see the two most important questions that God ever asked anybody in, in life, he asked to Hagar. The first time she runs away from Sarah because she's being abused so much she just can't take it anymore. Does that sound like some of us? Yeah, I think so, right? God finds her out in the wilderness and he asks two questions of her. Actually, it's the angel of the Lord. Finds her in the wilderness, he asks two questions. You know what the two questions are? If you don't know these questions, you, you need to go back and read Genesis, come on. This is the beginning of everything. The two questions. Where, where have you come from? Now, question number one. What are, you, what are you doing here? Where have you come from? Right? And you know what her answer is? I have come from the abuse of my mistress. In other words, the only thing she knows is her pain. That's where she comes from. And the second question is, where are you going? And Hagar can't answer that. So the angel of the Lord says to her, here's what I want you to do. It's the perfect advice, isn't it? I want you to go find that battered women's shelter down the street where you can get legal protection, et cetera, et cetera. Is that what he says? No. What does he say? Go back to the pain. I'm with you. And golly, the strength of Hagar to go back to a relationship where she knows she's going to be abused, humiliated, and scorned every day of her pregnancy. And, and she does it. She goes back because God says, you need to understand who you are, and you can't do that by running away from the pain. Wow. Amazing stuff. Okay, well, we just got started. But on the break, <laughs> literally, we just got started. There's a whole bunch of stuff. But on the breakout, you might ask yourself the, the question, where did you come from? Where are you going? Who was your father? And I'll give you the other part of that question. When did you learn that God was a tyrant or that God was a loving father? When did that happen in your life? Because that image of father dominates how you understand who God is, right? My absentee father left me with a God who was a theological construct, not a person, okay? And I've lived with that for 70 years. My brothers, my whole family, they live with all that. Not because my father intended it, but because his father was absent from his life. His father died when he was 12. What did he know about the relationship with God? There was no one there to nourish him when he felt bad. No one to put his arm around him, right? His mother remarried an alcoholic. That just became more disastrous. I mean, that history that goes back and back and back, you need to know because you're carrying the baggage. And when Jacob walks out of that family, he's got a, a suitcase big enough to put on a camel. We have the same thing. So the challenge to you for the little breakout that you're going to do is, where did you come from? Right? What, when did your story start? Because I can guarantee you it didn't start on the day of your birth. What do you know about your parents' a relational and emotional context that will help you understand the baggage that you carried from the day you were born? And what do you know about your grandparents on both sides that will help you understand why your parents were the way they were? Right? The Bible is this huge, emotional, connect-the-dots story so that you and I as readers can start doing the process. Right? So, go to work and we'll come back. Ah, write your story. Uh, yeah, let's write the, is the, it's the one with the, 
You're the guy. Yeah, okay, so there's a video clip here. This comes from the movie The International. Listen. We might have to play it twice. It's awesome. The screenwriter did a fabulous job with this. Okay? I click to it. Here it is. Listen. I was once destined to become a man much like yourself. True-hearted. Determined. Full of purpose. But uh, character is easier kept than recovered. We cannot control the things life does to us. They are done before you know it. And once they are done, they make you do other things. Until at last everything comes between you and the man you wanted to be. Get that? Do we need to hear it again? We need to hear it again. Listen to what he says. It's so true of us. Okay? One more time. Whoop. Back up. The beginning of this is, is us, right? I was once destined to be a man much like yourself true-hearted, full of purpose, and then listen to what he says happened. I was once destined to become a man much like yourself, true-hearted, determined, full of purpose. But uh, character is easier kept than recovered. We cannot control the things life does to us. They are done before you know it. And once they are done, they make you do other things. Until at last everything comes between you and the man you wanted to be. Oh, that's powerful. Character is easier kept than recovered. Oh my gosh. If your son knows that and lives that, he will avoid so much heartache. This is a great, great clip. If you want to see it again, go get the movie International. It's all about what happens to this man and how he, at the end of his life, recovers character that he had lost in all these little choices all along the way. That's, that's me. That's maybe you. Right? Got to know where we're going. All right, gentlemen. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, is it? Yeah. Who were you destined to be? I was once a man destined. To great purpose. True hearted. What happened along the way? And is your past redeemable? <laughs> you know, we don't undo the past. It just has to get incorporated into a new story. To try to erase the past is a huge mistake because it is who you are. My past begins in grandparents I never knew. And all those holes put huge holes in my life that I tried to fill with other things. Yep. All right. Come back sometime. 